I'm Scott Allen Miller. It is the 11th of June, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. Today, we're going to be talking about computers and technology, getting them here to Nicaragua, what you're going to use, what you're going to have, all that kind of stuff. We're also going to touch on the topic of people working remote jobs in the U.S. and the problems finding work for all those people now. It's a big thing that has come up in the U.S. and I think I have some important points to make, so we're going to get to that right after the bump. is common here in Nicaragua, I can hear at the same time distant drums from a marching band and the roll of thunder as an afternoon storm rolls in. I love it. It's really cool. So that is what's going on. Before I get to today's real topic of computers and equipment here in Nicaragua, I'm going to talk first about an article I just read in Slate magazine and wanted to wanted to, to fill out a little bit more about it because I thought it was really interesting. So really quickly, the story goes something like this. Uh, a couple who didn't have wonderful jobs, but they had okay jobs, uh, working traditional on site at an office or whatever uh, before COVID or the meltdown of the American working world uh, had their jobs become fully remote. Both this person and their spouse then moved to someplace where their family was from, someplace very reasonable, a few hours away, where it was much lower cost. They had been in a city where they had been for jobs and they moved to a lower cost place because it was lower cost and they could afford to live and actually have a nice home. They sold their, their starter home when prices soared and they bought a place that they could actually afford and live decently well. As soon as they moved, both of them ended up losing their jobs uh, just because the economy melted down and the number of unemployed people went way up. Only temporarily, now it's way back down again. But this happened to them and they lost their jobs. And as so many people have found, remote work was something that companies did when they wanted to get the best and brightest, when they wanted to attract the best employees, they wanted to retain employees, they went with remote work because it's how you encourage good people to work for you. Now the culture has changed. There is a surplus of workers and companies are less concerned about going for the best and they are exercising their muscles to show workers that the companies are in charge. In doing so, they've drawn people back in, even though it costs more and produces less, as is common knowledge, there's no argument made that having people in the office on average is good for any company. It's as, so I'm a business consultant. The term we use is politics over profits. These are companies that are announcing they're all about their internal politics and they don't care about actually making money. If you're an investor, this is something you should be aware of. Private equity firms especially end up with this problem where a private equity company comes in, puts a bunch of money into a business. That business then already has their money and makes more money from the investors than they do from the customers. And so they switch to playing politics rather than trying to make profits. It is a really common model. And in the U.S. where people tend to invest blindly, meaning they don't actively manage the businesses that they invest in, politics often become where employees make their money. And so you can see this anytime you hear companies that are not letting people work efficiently and willing to pay to make them less efficient, to make them have to commute, to make them unhappy. Little rant over, but so this is happening in America. So this person is saying they lost their jobs. Now they can't find jobs. And they're living in a lower cost place and these pla companies are claiming hybrid work and are saying, oh, it's the best of both worlds or some places are just requiring on site, but they can't afford to go to those places because they now live in places that don't have those jobs. And even the hybrid work, they can't afford to commute three hours a few days a week. And even if it was just once a week, it would be an incredible burden to do that commute, especially considering it doesn't assist the job. Now, as someone who did this, I did hybrid work back in the early 2000s. I commuted six hours between New York and Washington, D.C. because I didn't want to live in Washington, D.C. I wanted to live in Ithaca, New York. I mentioned that briefly on the episode yesterday. I used to do that, so I'm, I'm aware of that system and why it has its benefits and its huge downsides. That was a great example of a place I never needed to be in the office. My office was so far remote from the people that I was working with, the fact that I was there just cost them more money and they went out of business. So the two things go together. So 
this is a problem going on. This person in the Slate article said, I'm not trying to work from the beach in Fiji. I'm just trying to live in an affordable place in America so that the job I'm able to do pays enough that I'm able to live. But now that they're requiring them to go into offices, they can't afford to do those jobs anymore. And I thought this was really interesting because it occurred to me that the mistake that these people are making, and it's not necessarily their fault, like everyone has their own needs, right? So they went somewhere where family was. I get it. They want to be around their parents, they're around their grandkids, their cousins, whatever. That makes sense. Obviously, people want to do that, and, and no one should be, should be put into a situation where you can't stay with family. But the thing that she said that was such an important point, we didn't want to live on a beach. We didn't want to send emails from a beach in Fiji. And I think that's the actual mistake. The thing that the majority of Americans or anyone in these economies are doing is they're kind of just going halfway with remote work. They're saying, okay, my job allowed me to go remote and I went remote, but not really remote. I just went down the street remote. I sold my house downtown and I moved out to the suburbs or I sold my house in the suburbs and I moved out to the country. I moved to a small village. I moved to a lower cost state or a different tax district. Okay, but when you do that, you might shave 10% off of your cost of living, maybe 20%. That's about the maximum. And in many cases, it's just like 5%. And you take that risk. One of the reasons that we always lived in cities before, one of the reasons I worked in Washington, D.C., lived in Manhattan, um, in all kinds of cities, right? Dallas. Why was I always in a city? Because there's not just a job that I have. There's lots of other jobs that I might have and jobs for my wife. Right? So if you're a dual income family, as almost everyone in America has to be, you have to consider not just your flexibility for work, but both of your flexibility for work. And so cities arose because America so often prioritizes politics over profits and because some jobs simply do have to be co-located and because they have dual income. This forces people into high cost cities and raises the cost of living and the cost of housing because people have no choice. You have to live in a place, not have to, but almost have to live in a place where there are many jobs and the flexibility so that both people in a dual income family have the ability to switch jobs without moving. That's a big deal. My career, one of the reasons I was able to do so well in my career was because I got far enough in my career that my wife never had to work. She did work for a number of years at the beginning, but she never had to. We always had the flexibility of being a single income family and she would regularly give up her career or whatever job she had and move to wherever I was getting a promotion because my promotions were often larger than her income. So it didn't make any sense for us to plan things around her and she didn't like her career paths too much. She really hated her original one. She switched to do the better things and then she had more flexibility. So often when I moved, she would end up moving up as well with her job. But that flexibility to treat us as a single income family allowed us to earn so much more that we were able to be a single income family. That's rare, but that flexibility was a big deal. And if we depended on both of our incomes because we had taken on so much of a mortgage or whatever, we'd have been completely hosed. Every time my job forced me to move, we'd have been trapped either giving up an income and not being able to pay our bills or having to stay behind and give up the job and move to something else and just take whatever was available in that market at that time, which may have been okay, but it may not have been. We were in a position, and I talked about it yesterday, how we got stuck with multiple houses for decades. And we did that on a single income. Not very many people can do that. That's not a normal thing. The ability to do that, that we had one person staying home with the kids full time and I stayed home with the kids almost full time. Since my daughter was born from when Liesl was born, my eldest, who is now 14 and a half, I went to work in the office, not the first year that she was alive, but the second year she was alive, I worked directly across the street from our apartment. So I would walk, she would watch me walk into the office. She would watch me walk out of the office. She could see my office doors from our balcony right? And she hated it, but she was, she was one, right? When I would leave for work, she would cry, and, and, but I would come home for lunch. She would see me throughout the day. I was never more than a 10-minute walk away, and she could see me as I approached and see me as I left, right? So that was about the maximum that we ever did apart from each other. Then over the next few years, I worked mostly remote, but it was hybrid, so I would go into the office some days, but I'd be home a lot of the time, a lot of the time, 
All right, at most I would work generally like six hour days in the office. If I did go in, I rarely did a full day. So I was kind of home during that time. And remember my wife was home full time. And then after just a couple years, when, when Liesl was four years old, is the last time that I really went into an office like that. We then had one year less than a year, 10 months, in which I had to work full-time from an office, and it was terrible, and both of my children refer to it as the year that I was gone. It's important to note, though, I just went to work like normal people, right? I had a normal commute, I had a normal work day, maybe slightly more stressful, slightly longer, but it was not an incredibly long day, it was not record-breaking, I didn't commute super far, we moved to a place that made sense just for that job, and I commuted for that job, and that job would let me work from home once in a while. So it was still a little bit hybrid, but generally in the office, about 90% of the time was in the office. That, me going to work like a normal average American, my children referred to as the year without their father. After that, we decided I was never going into the office again, or not for any amount of time. And so since uh, my kids were about three and five, I've never gone back to an office. And we've managed to be dual parents at home for nearly their entire lives. That's huge. Most people don't get to do that. That's because of these systems in America. It's so hard to do those things. We are so fortunate that we had that. And then we were able to take that and leverage it to, we're leaving the country entirely and just went and lived wherever we wanted and lived around Europe and lived around Latin America and now live permanently in Nicaragua because we love it here and it suits our needs really, really well. Okay, so all of this is to get to my point. These people who are talking about, they didn't do what we did. They didn't make themselves able to work in a, in a single family mode. They didn't make the, or a single income family mode. They didn't make themselves go to a really low cost location. They just cut the difference. They said, well, I'm not gonna move far. I'm not gonna go to Fiji. I'm just going to go down the street to where it's too far to commute, but I'm still kind of here. And I'm not gonna leave this tax jurisdiction. I'm just gonna slightly lower my cost of living. Nothing really changed. And then when they're not situated in this high cost city location with all the flexibility to do the dual income thing, now they're panicking and screwed because they no longer have the house that they had originally and they can't afford to go back. And now they live in a place that they have to pay for but can't get jobs. What if they had gone to that beach in Fiji? What if they had come to Nicaragua? This is where everything changes. The income you need to live in Nicaragua, we've talked about this in other episodes. If you're making, let's say, $25,000 a year, which is below minimum wage for a lot of the US and around about minimum wage for the rest of it. It's not, not a dramatic number. Or if you're working as like a professional making a lot of money per hour, let's say you make $100 per hour, you'd only need to work whatever that is, right? 10 hours a week to make that money. It would be less than that, right? And you'd be bringing in that kind of income, uh, probably five hours a week, right? Something like that. Because you're living in Nicaragua, you have a bunch of things that change. Your cost of living changes completely. You're not going from a $1,500 a month rent to a $1,200 a month rent. You're going from a $1,500 a month rent to a $300 a month rent, right? You're cutting 80% off the cost. You're not going from a $90 dinner to a $75 dinner. You're going from a $90 dinner to a $12 dinner, right? Again, 80% knocked right off. You're not going from paying 45% taxes to paying 40% taxes you're going from 45% taxes to zero taxes or 1%. There's some tiny itty bitty number that you keep paying. That's where it's different. We're talking about absolutely changing your lifestyle numbers. If you're in a position where I'm just guessing about this example in Slate, but if you're a dual income family struggling to pay for a house, they're probably have a household income south of $100,000 to combined, right? And especially now that they're having struggles getting jobs at all. Maybe they have a household income of about $50,000 in the US. And some of you will say, that's fine. And some of you will be like, how could you live? It all depends where you're coming from and your perspective. But let's say they are living at 50,000, maybe $60,000 as a family in the US. So that's what they're surviving on and barely making it. And they're always in a panic. If they were to move to Nicaragua, they would need less than $20,000 to live that well, possibly much less. Right now, you're not going to want to go down to $5,000 a year or anything like that. That would be really painful, even though you would probably keep from starving. It would be really rough. But going down to very low numbers, numbers below American, min American minimum wage for a single worker, and you have two people potentially to do it in this example, right? If you had two people each bringing in $10,000 a year, you could live 
reasonably well. Of course, you'd be living in the same house, so you're splitting bills and, and all that. If you had to live individually on $10,000, it'd be much harder, right? Because you'd have two rents to deal with, even though each one would be a little bit lower. They wouldn't be dramatically lower. It's combining your, your electric bills. It's combining your rent and, and combining your, your transport. That's what makes it affordable. But so if you had two people who were able to work remotely and each bring in 10,000 or really great 15 to 20,000, you'd be living great I can tell you $35,000 a year as a budget in Nicaragua goes a really long way. Because remember, it's $35,000 cash. You're not paying taxes, at least not after your first year, if you're American. If you're like Canadian, you don't pay taxes your first year. Uh, so th the numbers are totally different. The cost is like 80% less for most things, and then you don't pay taxes. The amount that this scales up your earnings is so dramatic. And I'm not saying that Nicaragua was the answer. I'm saying that this person said, I wasn't trying to be on a beach in Fiji. And what I'm saying is if you'd have gone to that beach in Fiji, this wouldn't be the problem that you're facing now. You wouldn't have this huge rent. You wouldn't have these huge taxes. You wouldn't have all these expenses. Of course, Fiji's more expensive than Nicaragua, but it's not expensive like the US. They'd be in a completely different game. They'd be able to go out and look for work in a completely different position. They could ask for less money, be more competitive. They could be more relaxed because they live in paradise. They could be more relaxed because they don't have to have these huge bills that they have to pay. It would be easier for their family to help them out should they get into dire circumstances. Really, every aspect short of giving up and flying to the office and just doing some massive commute would be better. Yes, once you live in Nicaragua, packing everything up and moving back to the United States to go back to the office, would be a little bit painful. Yet, we know people who do it all the time. It's not that big of a deal. And they saved money until they went back, making it less of a deal. Possibly still a really good deal to have come down. So I want people to really think about this. And it's so tempting when you're dealing with these work remotes and all these situations with jobs in the US to say, well, I'm going to, I'm gonna just, you know, I'm not gonna take the leap all the way. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ease out of whatever. It doesn't often make sense. I think that people are putting themselves in, in these examples at incredible risk for their jobs because they're not getting the tax benefits. They're not getting the housing benefits. They're not getting the food benefits. They're not getting the safety benefits and the, the luxury benefits and the relaxing benefits and the mental freedom benefits and the interesting benefits. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with potential clients that go fantastic when they're like, so where are you based? Oh, I'm in Nicaragua. Let me tell you about it. And it, it just opens the doors to amazing conversations that don't happen when you say, I live in my, my parents' farmhouse, right? It's, it's really, it has its benefits. Uh, and I think that um, while it's not going to be the same for everybody, and depending on the job you do and your personal personality and a lot of factors, um, it's, it's, it's going to be wildly different for different people. But it's important to visualize this entire thing that this idea of being cautious for most things, the human brain sees reckless as cautious and cautious as reckless. We see this in, in investing all the time. People will say things like, well, savings account is conservative. That is not true. Savings account is insane, right? It's fine to put your money in for the weekend or for a month. But if you're saving your money in a savings account, you know your savings account makes less than inflation. You're literally throwing the money away. You know that index funds almost always beat inflation to a point where you can safely always beat inflation when you need to. That's conservative. There's nothing more conservative than an index fund. There's nothing more reckless than bonds and savings accounts. And yet people teach the exact opposite. And everyone who's in finance is like, what? What are they teaching? How could the common sense says not beating inflation is the worst thing short of just setting your money on fire, right? It's literally tantamount to shoving your money in a mattress, except a mattress you bury in the backyard and hope no one steals. It's nuts, and yet everybody teaches it. Why? Because people who make money know that if everyone else does stupid things with their money, there's more money for other people to make, right? Bad advice is rampant. But that, it's easy to trick the human mind into, ooh, investing seems scary. Buy a bond, it's guaranteed. Yeah, guaranteed to lose. Of course they're gonna guarantee it because it's losing. That's an easy guarantee to make. You know what, if you pay me $10, I guarantee I'll pay you back nine in a month. <laughs> okay, nice. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that guarantee all day long, right? That's what it's like. These things, these, these trying to be cautious and not really 
coming up with how is it cautious? How did, in this particular case of this slate example, how were they being cautious by going three hours away and keeping the expenses and keeping the risk and keeping the overhead and the, and the stress and, the, and all that? Go to the beach in Fiji. It would have solved your problems. All right, coming up next, we're going to talk about computers and computer equipment here in Nicaragua. I get asked a lot about how you can bring computers into Nicaragua. This could be a computer you're using for work. It could be one you're using for uh, a hobby. It could be just, you know, how you do your shopping or maybe you're playing video games. There's always a reason to have computers here. Uh, and, and it really brings up a lot of questions because yes, Nicaragua is a very small country in a very large region and they have to be very careful with import controls because if they look the other way and let you just bring anything you want in what will happen is that expats will import in massive numbers huge amounts of equipment and sell it in the country bypassing the tax and import duties that are necessary to pay for social services in the country. If you were doing this in the United States, you would get the exact same result, right? You can't just import things for sale into the US and hope to get past uh, the tax office, right? You're going to get busted eventually. The difference is here in Nicaragua, individual people, especially those coming from the US, can easily smuggle in their luggage enough electronics to be a major problem. And it doesn't seem that way to Americans who are used to everything being so expensive and there being so many people... and so many people in the economy and, and just so much going on. So the possibility exists here for just a very few tourists to bring in so many electronics that it would, it would disrupt portions of the economy and cause real problems. So Nicaragua, like many small countries, need to regulate what is brought in so that they're able to maintain the standard tariffs and duties and taxes and importation oversight that every country has, right? It's simply seeing the same things that happen in America, but on a more personal scale, because it's such a smaller country. That's all. So the way that it works is basically this. You can bring in all kinds of things. It's not that things are restricted. It's that the number of them you can bring in without it being an import is very low. That's all. Right, Nicaragua is a very open country in general. There are some things that are notably restricted. At the last that we knew, drones are still... The last that we have heard, drones are still heavily restricted. And some people have said, no, I think they've been allowed. I've checked with the authorities, trust me, they are still not allowed. But they could be allowed at any moment because other things that were not allowed suddenly became allowed. There was a very brief period of time, and this is a problem, for 12 hours, maybe 20 hours, they had a restriction that was about to come into effect on cameras, and it was shot down before it ever came into effect. And it never limited that you could bring in cameras, it was simply that you couldn't bring in really good cameras, but their definition of really good was pretty fuzzy, and that's where it ran into problems. But before it came into effect, the government came down and said, absolutely not, there will be no restrictions on cameras whatsoever, completely allowed to bring anything in, and the whole issue went away, but people still, even though it only lasted for a few hours and was a while ago, people mention it all the time. Oh, you're not allowed to bring anything in. Wait, yes, you are. You're allowed to bring just about anything. The biggest restrictions that people need to be aware of, that I'm aware of, is you cannot bring in more than one cell phone. You get one cell phone. If you want to bring in one for personal and one for work, that's probably not going to work. Of course, you may sneak in, someone may not say anything, they may not notice that you have two, but officially you're allowed one. If you bring in two, assume one of them could be confiscated because you're importing a phone. And remember, legally, you're coming in as a tourist. So the guideline that everything is written around is what can you bring in as a tourist? And if it's, I'm coming in to work, well, that's fine, you're allowed to work, but you need to pay import tax on those things if they're really work items beyond your personal. And here in Nicaragua, no one understands the idea of having two phones for work. They think that's absurd. That's a level of throwing money around that makes no sense and has no business purpose in the Nicaraguan mindset. And honestly, I come from business in the US. I can't imagine a scenario where I would have people with two cell phones. That's a thousand dollars for a second device. And who wants to have two phones on them? One phone can do it all. If you have them, like give them a stipend or something. <laughs> That's weird, right? So legitimately, it doesn't make much sense for people to be carrying two cell phones when they travel. You don't need to do that. You don't need that for SIM cards. You don't need that for any travel reason. And if you need to get extra cell phones, it's not like they're restricted here. You can buy as many cell phones as you want. And they started at about $100 new. 
So just buy the, buy one here if that's really a thing that you need. So they restrict that so that you can't be using, because it's really easy for a person to come through with 20 cell phones on them. It would only take a couple tourists to completely undermine one of the largest importation markets in the country. So those are very restricted, just one per person, but it's per person. Your kids can have them. I come in with four every time, right? I have four people, four phones, right? Because we all have a phone. That's normal. Every person gets a computer. You can all bring a laptop. You can all bring an iPad. You can all bring a phone. You can have a lot of stuff. The thing that starts being a problem is when you start having multiples of things. Well, I have a bunch of tablets. Why do you have a bunch? That sounds like you're trying to sell one, right? Now, of course, you can come in with just a cell phone and still sell it. You can come with an iPad and still sell it, right? But the amount you can sell and the amount you could do that is limited and they take their chances. But if you're coming in with multiples, it's really easy for you to be just selling one every time you come and still have one that you travel with and then there's a bunch of revenue being lost and they need that. So that's why those things are restricted and they do it based on does it look like business? So be aware if you're bringing in a desktop, that's often okay. But if you're bringing in a desktop and monitors and all kinds of stuff, like what tourist needs a bunch of monitors? Well, you're probably not doing it because you're a tourist. You're probably doing it because you're working and you're totally allowed to do that. I did, right? They weren't mad about it. I didn't get in trouble for it. I just had to pay a bunch of taxes on it and it would have been smarter to buy the stuff here. That's the trick, is they want you to buy it here so that all the taxes are handled. If you make them deal with it at the importation office, you're gonna probably pay even more. None of those things are actually restricted. The only things that we really know are restricted are the drones um, and the multiple cell phones that there really is a limit there. I don't know that you can pay for a second one through taxes, that one, don't try it. Um, I know you'll, you'll sneak through a lot of the times, but you don't want your phone confiscated. If you bring multiple laptops, you're just going to have to pay import on them if they notice. Everything's and if they notice. You can get any number of people who tell you, oh, but I did it. I didn't have a problem. Of course. No one's saying you can't sneak through from time to time. There are people who come through with drones in their shorts. Like, that's a real thing. But if you want to know, are you breaking a rule? Are you subject to legitimate taxation if you bring those things? That's what we're discussing. Right. Of course, there's all kinds of people who come with an extra laptop and no one says anything. And maybe you they thought you were with someone or they didn't notice that you had it or they thought it was cheap and they didn't care. I came through with multiple desktops and they took my expensive desktops out and are like, oh, no, these are fine. And then they took out one video gaming machine because it was large. And they're like, now nah, you got to pay taxes on this. So I had to pay taxes on a really cheap item and not on all the expensive ones. I brought in like four computers that day. They only cared about one, uh, the, the cheapest of the four, right? So while you're likely to get dinged if you bring a lot of stuff in, they're not necessarily really going after everything for every dime. People say they are, and they're certainly not cheap, and once in a while you'll get screwed, but it's because it's kind of discretionary uh, and it's the roll of the dice. But in general, it's as long as you're acting like a tourist, you have nothing to worry about. Uh, and it's really obvious, right? I've never had a person try to do it where then the explanation is not, well, I'm trying to set up an office. Well, I'm trying to stock stuff in my house. Well, I'm trying, yes, it's because you're living here and you need to bring stuff in. That's fine, but you're gonna pay taxes, right? Like everyone else, that's that's really what's going on. I When I was in customs a couple of years ago, there was a person who was bringing in a water filter, right? Do you need a water filter? Like, not, I don't mean like a Brita filter, right? Not like a, not like a portable thing. I mean like the filter for an industrial system. And they like kept arguing that they didn't need to pay taxes on it but that's not a tourist item. You are not a tourist with that. You're importing it. It's just a one item import. He got, he got hit with a bunch of taxes, right? If you want to bring things in like that, chances are you want to ship them. That's what services like Nikabox uh, and, and um, there's, a, there's a handful of them, right? They do this and they either do it by volume or by weight or whatever, and you just pay and they handle, they pay the import fees and it's kind of predictable and you generally don't get too screwed as long as you're doing the right things and, and have the right paperwork. Um, and paid the original prices or whatever. Uh, we're getting a bit of wind. We have a storm rolling in. The sky's gotten dark. Uh, hoping for some rain here pretty soon. And whoa, there's the wind. So by and large, what you're bringing in needs to be limited or you need to be prepared to pay taxes on it. What can you get here in the country then? Well, the selection here is generally pretty rough. Computer stores have very little selection. It tends to be old, low-end equipment, things with a lot of memory, very hard to get. Desktops, very hard to get. Most everyone works from old laptops that are underpowered. It's sad. Every time we come into the country, we get new laptops. It's just worth it. It's a place where we think it's worth investing all the time. 
and it makes sense for us. Uh, and then we're able to hand down our laptops, right? So I get a new one, my old one goes to my kids or whatever, and, and they goes to someone else. Like you, you find use for that because even our five-year-old laptops, because we have five-year-old really good laptops with lots of memory and, and SSDs, are better than what a lot of people have here. So you, you're gonna find uses for it, even if it gets old while you're living here and you're replacing things a little bit more often, yeah fine it's really not a big deal everything else is so cheap that spending a little bit more on your technology or being a little bit more focused on how you do your technology is going to make a little bit of a difference if you need to buy stuff here in country you absolutely can there's an hp store at the mall i just did a short on it the other day there is a i store not an apple store we are the only country that apple knows of that borders no country that borders no country with an apple store because we border costa rica and and honduras and neither of them border a country that has an Apple store because Panama and El Salvador and Guatemala and Belize don't have Apple stores. Mexico does, Colombia does, but none of the countries that border, any of the countries that border us have one. And I said that once to Apple and they're like, there's a country like that? And they check the map, they're like, oh my gosh, there is. We are the ultimate black hole for Apple support. There's still an iStore in the mall and you can buy Apple stuff. It's just gonna be more expensive and less selection and you don't get direct Apple support. Uh, you can go to fix it shops. I just had, so the machine that we brought in two years ago uh, got very dusty, had some electrical problems, and I had to take it to a shop to actually just be cleaned out. So I ended up doing that and went to a store here in the city uh, and they were able to fix it, no problem. They have parts, they have people who more or less know what they're doing. I don't know how much expertise they have. I'm not saying one way or another, just they're able to fix some basic things for sure. Um, but be aware, every bit of electronics you do here in the country, including repair, is going to be really expensive. Much more expensive, I think, even than in the US, even for the labor, because it's so rare and there's so few people doing it and they, there, there's no competition. Um, that's a spot where there's a major gap in the market. People have a really hard time getting affordable technology and then a really hard time maintaining that technology and having the expertise to understand things like running Linux, different operating systems, um, you know, all that is really, really lacking. Um, so people end up spending a lot more. That's a place where the US does really well. What a lot of people do when they move here is they learn to do with fewer electronics. That's a major thing that tends to happen. Uh, things that we often see is things like uh, PlayStation 5s or the newest Xboxes. Those can be problematic to bring in because again, you don't look like a tourist. But something like a... But something like a Nintendo Switch or a... Uh, um, Steam Deck, which are portable, even though they're super powerful, especially the Steam Deck, no one can argue that a Nintendo Switch is powerful. It was not powerful five years ago. Uh, it's certainly not powerful now, but a Steam Deck, a really powerful video game machine, you can bring in no problem because that's something a tourist would have. And so for us, we found that in video gaming, we're moving more towards buying Steam Decks now that we're here, instead of buying other kinds of video game machines. We've learned to be a little bit more flexible in the technology that we're choosing, and sometimes spending more, sometimes spending less, sometimes buying more things, sometimes just doing without some things. We're adjusting, we're making different choices, and that's something that you'll do over time. And of course, everyone has different technological needs. Some people just need a Mac to work on, like me, because I use Final Cut Pro to make this for you. That's where it comes from. So I have a Mac for that but I have no problem getting my Macs because I travel to the US at least once a year and I have family that comes and goes at least once or twice a year so I have a few times per year that someone can bring me a new laptop if I need or even a new desktop because I use the Mac mini and so mini computers are a better value because they're much more likely to come through they're reasonably something you would travel with as opposed to a big honking uh, gaming system or something that's like well that's not reasonable for travel obviously you're coming to stay, you're not taking that back home. And they were right, we weren't taking it back home. So the fact that we paid taxes on it, okay, I didn't want to, but it, they were right. <laughs> so I can't really complain about that. So uh, that kind of stuff, you might make those choices where you're going for more portable items rather than fewer stationary ones. A lot of people do that already, right? You may aim for more wireless and less wired just because they have better wireless gear here and not so good wired gear. Little things, you'll, you'll make some different choices. Uh, but in general, we have really good internet. You can get computers, you just can't get them as easily. Uh, if you're buying locally, you're much more constrained. Those of us who are able to travel back and forth to the US Canada, well, not Canada, Canada has the same problems, right? I would never wanna buy a laptop or anything in Canada. It's the same problems as here except you're in a high cost area and have these problems? No thanks. Uh, but the, you can go to US, Mexico, Panama and get stuff at reasonable prices and bring them back here. So that's something you'll have to work into your planning. If you don't wanna do that, then you're just gonna spend more money here, but you're not traveling. Okay, not a big deal. Um, if you really need 
all kinds of the latest, greatest technology, yeah, Nicaragua could be a challenge for you. You may have specific things you need to work out. Get down there in those questions and let me know, and maybe I can work something out. Uh, it gives you some ideas of how you would handle a specific case. But in general, we can get what we need, but you need to plan more. So a lot of dealing with computers and technology in Nicaragua comes down to proper planning and rethinking your approaches. You may choose different devices because they're more consumer grade. You may choose to have devices that are easier to replace. You may need to think about purchasing early and maintaining a spare. You may think about planning your purchasing around when you're going to travel and may think about it long in advance. Those kinds of things become really significant, whereas in the US, you tend to be like, oh, my computer broke, I'll just go on Amazon, have another one here tomorrow, maybe even later today. You can't do that here. You can run to a store, you're gonna pay a premium. If you really want to save money and you wanna have the kind of selection that you're used to, you're gonna have to put a lot more work into it. And I find that now that I'm used to it, it's not a big deal. I do a lot more planning. I I tend to buy a lot more proactively. I keep spares and I lean towards laptops where I used to lean towards desktops and I use smaller items and things like that. I have to rethink some things that I do, but not others. And I have to rethink what kind of monitors I use and what kind of mounts I use and how I get things. And I have to do a lot of planning ahead and I have to stage things in the US. And I know some things are gonna cost more and that's just how it is. And so it's all about adding this new layer of planning and being prepared for it. Thanks for joining me. My storm is rolling in. I'm going to bring this around so you can see this a little bit behind me. It is really coming in. We're getting so windy. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, help me buy computers because I got to do a lot of stuff for this channel. I need a lot of computers to do the things we do for real. Uh, buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. If, you'd be, if you're interested in having my team help out, whether it's with some consultations or helping you find a house or helping you with moving or whatever, just need some time on the phone, hit us up, shoot us an email, info at relocatenicaragua.com. Um, that's what we do and uh, like and subscribe tell your friends about the show post it on social media let people know and I will see all of you tomorrow